I think if you if you do GRC for an old archaic company, it's a hundred percent going to be boring. But I definitely want more people inside. But right, like we have like a global shortage. I think you know three point six million people. But you can't be a GRC professional and not know anything about a framework. That's just yeah. not going to work. Hey, Izzy, how's it going? Hey, how are you? <laughs> Doing all right. How about yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good. No complaints on this end. That's great. Thanks for hopping on. I believe this is your first podcast in quite a while. Yeah, I haven't done one in like two years, something like that. Wow. Yeah, that's been a long time. But thanks for hopping on to do this. Um, I'm super excited for this conversation. I think your experience and your knowledge, as well as like your specific sector in cybersecurity, it's definitely one that a lot of people need to hear about and just like, you know, have a better understanding of what exactly that looks like. So with that being said, do you want to sort of start us off with an introduction about yourself, who you are and like what you do? Yeah. So I'm Izzy. I've been, I'm coming up on my 12th year working in InfoSec. I know I look so young. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I've, I've been doing information security, GRC work, literally like six months after I graduated college. And I'm dating myself now, so now people are probably <laughs> going to go back and do some math. Yeah, I've been doing this for a while. I was active on Twitter, like, you know, being like a voice of InfoSec for a, a little bit. But then that kind of got really old really fast. So I kind of mm. took a step back and just kind of focused on real life stuff and not being like a like an influencer. But yeah, I've been doing this for a while. I don't know. I really don't know what else to say about myself. I'm not really good at intros. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's totally fine. I think we, we'll we we'll go deeper into that, you know, with some more specific questions. Uh, but I wanted to ask, like, is there a difference between, you know, the terminology information security and cybersecurity? Because sometimes people use it, like, interchangeably. And sometimes yeah. people typically refer to, like, information security as, like, a specific thing, and cybersecurity as a specific thing. What, what's the difference, if any? Yeah, so the term cybersecurity wasn't even a real term until like, I think it was like 2004 or something like that. But InfoSec always came first because information was was key, right? Yeah. You have information security and then cybersecurity is supposed to be a subset of information security mm -hmm. where you're, you're focusing on the actual like technical aspects of the information. Yeah. That's how I that's how I was taught and that's what I've learned in my master's program about the differences. Uh, a lot of people do use them interchangeably and I think that you can't have you can't have one without the other. Mm. Especially if we're talking about like in the digital world, right? Everything yeah. has data, everything has information. And then cybersecurity is just how we look at securing all of that data, that information on the technical plane. Gotcha. Thanks for clarifying that. I, I just call everything cybersecurity. So <laughs> it's always good to kind of, you know, enlighten one about like, you know, the differences between these different things and what they actually mean. So let's, you know, get into what a day or a week in your life looks like, you know, as what you do currently. So uh, for context, we both work at Datadog. So what does a day in your life look like? <sighs> it Honestly, there's no in between. It's either hectic or it's like, super chill. So I'll kind of give you like an example of like uh, when it's hectic, I'm running from meeting to meeting, talking to different engineers, talking to different staffers about anything from what their new project is that they're working on. Maybe they want to have like some input from someone like me that can kind of point out some security requirements or point out some considerations that they probably mm -hmm. haven't made. I'm also, you know, working on a couple of different projects. And I think on like some of my most busiest time, I'm also chatting with customers and making sure that they are good from a security standpoint, you know, that they want to onboard with Datadog. So I think that like there's, there's that. And then there's times where all I'm doing is updating, you know, documentation, which I think that that's like my low key chill weeks, which I prefer those weeks. <laughs> it's like <Yeah>. meetings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's pretty cool. So, I, I wanted to sort of clarify another thing, right? So your current role, you are at the staff level of this role. Now, I'm yeah. going to say, before I actually got into the other dog, I didn't know like there were actually like levels beyond senior. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the difference between, you know, someone who's a senior 
at your level or at, in your role versus someone who is a staff, you know, which is like, you know, the next step after that senior. What is like, what does that look like from that jump from senior to staff? Yeah. So I learned about staff levels a couple years ago before I started at Datadog and it looks different in every organization. So I'll only speak to Datadog. So senior, right, you still have like a manager you report, you report to. Obviously, everybody has a manager. But with the senior level, you're expected to be more autonomous with how you do your work. You're supposed to be able to identify some, some, some issues or some potential process improvements and like be able to propose how you can implement some of those things. But also still needing some guidance and, you know, being able to take direction from your management or your leadership. Now, the staff role at Datadog is very interesting because... I had a conversation with a couple of staffers. Just first of all, the first six months I was a staff, I didn't even know what I was supposed to be doing. Let's start here. (laughs) Most staffers don't know what you're supposed to do as Mm -hmm. a staffer, which is kind of ironic. But but what I learned is that you can be a staffer in two different ways. Mm -hmm. You can focus on process improvements or you can actually like solve problems using technology for Mm -hmm. your team or for multiple teams across Datadog. So my staff looks like process improvements that also benefit everyone across Datadog. So I'm working on projects that not only make myself look good, obviously, but the the team, (laughs) it makes InfoSec look good, but then it benefits like the engineering teams in terms of being able to better cohesively work with InfoSec. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thanks for clarifying that. One of my goals, like career-wise, is to eventually get to the staff level of security engineering and get into Datadog where like those things are like very well structured and like just realizing like what a staff engineer was versus what a, a, a senior engineer was. Um, and even like the next step above that, which is like the senior staff engineer, I was definitely like eye opening to like, you know, planning on how I want to, you know, sort of get there eventually in my career. But before go, before going into other things about cybersecurity, you know, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure you had a life before cybersecurity. You were doing something else before cybersecurity. So what did life look like before you got into cybersecurity? Ooh, so I don't think I had much of a life. <laughs> <laughs> because really what, what my life looked like is I was in college. I went mm-hmm. to the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. So I'm a Florida girl. And yeah. I, I actually didn't even do a, an undergraduate in anything technical. I, and the reason why I didn't is because my mom did not want me to do computer science, but I've mm-hmm. always wanted to be in the tech space. So, yeah. you know, I listened to my mom, didn't do it, but ended up in this path anyway. I was pretty busy in college. Like I I had a really packed social calendar. I, I was active in a bunch of clubs, bunch of organizations, I, you know. I have fun. I'll stay there. <laughs> if you know anything about Florida, the whole entire state in the college scene is yeah. like, a whole party scene. So, I know that. <clears throat> yeah. And and so I, I did four and a half years of business management and finance. That was my, those were my two undergraduate degrees. So I was a dual major because yeah. I, I, I guess I had something to prove to somebody that didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that and then I hated it. Like I, mm. I did six months in finance and I was just like nah I can't do this (laughs) I ended up getting a contract for I'm not going to say the company's name but it was like a major prominent bank and if if you know anything about Tampa you could kind of guess which one of the two it is but that's I kind of got into like cyber security ish things doing that because I was doing risk assessments and kind of like taking vulnerability scans and actually like creating an automated report on an on a sending out the vulnerability information to the teams that they that they belong to. So that was my start. But like in terms of a life, like outside of just hanging out and BSing as a <laughs> college student, that's, that's basically what I was doing before cyber. And right after college, I got into this field. So I went from like a, a baby to, I guess, a fully mature adult in cybersecurity. <laughs> right, right. No, that's so good to hear that. So what sparked your curiosity in cybersecurity? Because I, I know like, amongst all cybersecurity professionals, there's always something that is like that spark that ignites that fire of curiosity that wants them to want to pursue a career in cybersecurity. What was that for you? So that spark came, I think it was like a long, like a buildup to my spark. Mm -hmm. So the interest, I would say like my interest was peaked in cybersecurity when I, when I was looking to leave my old job, 
hated it. It was so bored. There was a lot of like drama too. That, that was another issue that I had. And I started this new role and it was like so much less drama, but also a lot more learning. Mm. And I realized that within like my first hour <laughs> being there that I was just like, you don't know anything. So you might want to, <laughs> you know, step up your game. Right. So I was learning about like how vulnerabilities are actually determined, how you weight them, how you score them. That was really cool for me. I was just like, oh, okay. I was like, I don't know what a vulnerability is, but this sounds cool and this yeah. sounds fun. I think that kind of like led me down the trail. And so I taught myself how to, you know, build this database and how to build this whole report. So I thought that was really, really cool. But mm. I've always been a tinkerer. Like when I was younger, I used to take my family computer and I used to just like play around and just like, you know, take it apart. And I used to get yelled at all the time for doing stuff like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if, you, if you're in a Caribbean household, that computer was a family computer. So me taking right. something apart, you know, like that was a big deal. So I, that, that kind of like, sparked or started the spark and then it wasn't until the target and the home depot breach happened that i was just like yep this is it for me because i actually <laughs> i actually was working at the company that was managing the target and home depot i'm sorry the target not home depot target and uh what was that other one that happened shortly after it doesn't matter. Let's just stick with okay. it. Right. Um, uh, I was actually supporting that team when that happened. So I kind of got a firsthand look of like, okay, this is what happens when you don't have like proper security controls, when your technology has like either gaps in the implementation or something failed within your process. Yeah. And I was just like, ooh, this is a big deal because it was a lot of money. I don't know. I don't remember how much it was, but it was something in like the hundreds of millions. Yeah. Or hundreds of hundreds. Of, yeah. I was just like, ooh, this is crazy. But also like, this is kind of fun. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I'm like a glutton for punishment, but <laughs> that was it for me. I was just right. like, yep, I got to do this. This, this mm. is it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's really cool. I think like each cybersecurity professional I have conversations with, like there's always like a unique event that um, sort of happens whether in their career or their childhood. Uh, that's like, oh, this is it. Like, I, I like this. I choose this. I choose this path. It's kind of, it's kind of cool to see them like kind of grow from there. Let's move into governance, risk, and compliance, um, especially in this age of the cloud. Like, a lot of co organizations are moving into the cloud, either like just transitioning from like on-prem environments to the cloud. You know, going at full scale. Some are just like kind of slowly doing it, and some have been in the cloud for a long time. Uh, what does that look like? How, how, how have things shifted from? how people were doing governance and risk and, risk and compliance, you know, in general traditional on-prem environments to how they're doing it now in the cloud. And what are those nuances that determine like how it's done in the cloud environments? Yeah, I think a lot of people assume that just because something's in the cloud that it's suddenly like more safe or more risky. Mm. And I think that that on both both ends it's a misconception, right? Like it's it's the same risk. You're just either transferring it to someone else or you are choosing to ignore the risk. And so one of the one of the things that I was able and fortunate to see is like how to transition my skills working with um, organizations that were on-prem to cloud-based. I, I got a firsthand look of both aspects. So on one end, a lot of GRC professionals, they're just like, well, I don't know anything about the cloud and I don't want to learn about it because, you know, I don't, you know, because for some people, it's like some magical black box where yeah. things go into and they never come out. And it's like, <laughs> okay, but you can still learn about this, right? Yeah. Like somebody has to determine compliance. Somebody has to govern. Somebody has to determine risk and somebody has to make sure it's compliant. That's yeah. basically what GRC does across the board for all industries. And so a lot of GRC professionals, I think that they miss opportunities to kind of like learn more about cloud and what does that actually look like? Mm -hmm. Like, yes, AWS does have to maintain you know, controls on their end, but that doesn't mean that they're automatically applicable to you and your organization or your environment. You still yeah. have to use the right configurations. You still have to ensure that the data is secure. Like AWS is responsible for the security of the cloud, but you're responsible for the security in the cloud. Yeah. So you, that's usually how I look at it uh, from that aspect. But then there's some people who really, really embraced it and they rode that wave and tried to understand like what the responsibility matrix really means in terms of implementing controls right 
So for me, I always wanted to be on the, let me ride the wave and let me learn some new skills and let me figure out what does compliance look like in this new cloud. It's not really new anymore because cloud has been around for a while, but yeah. a lot of companies are slow to adapt. And so for, I think there should be like a healthy skepticism of yeah. cloud, right? Because as a security professional, you should trust but verify, mm -hmm. but you should still move forward in the direction that technology is taking you. Yeah. If you don't, you're going to be left behind. Yeah. No, I love how you really explained that. And from the way you broke all of these things down, you know, we, the cloud, there's there's responsibility for security off the cloud and then security in the cloud. So like that's like different paradigms between what the cloud provider is responsible for, what organizations are responsible for, and how G uh, GRC comes in, in to play in, in, in regards to that. And all of that does sound like a lot of interesting and mentally uh, stimulating work. And one thing that people talk about a lot, especially in social media, is... GRC is boring, right? <laughs> and from what you said, it does sound like there's a lot that goes into it. Like it, it doesn't sound all that boring. So is it actually as boring as people on social media and like everyone just, you know, says it's uh, it, it to be or is like, what, what, what exactly is that point there? <laughs> so I'll, I'll say yes and no. Okay. I think if you, if you do GRC for an old archaic company, it's 100% <laughs> going to be boring. Right. Like if your company is just like, nope, we're not looking at new technology. We're not growing in these new sectors at all. Mm -hmm. You're going to hate what you do because yeah. that means that you're probably just going to be writing policies all day. You're probably just going to be doing risk assessments all day and that's it. Right. But if you are doing GRC for like a cutting edge company, because one of my friends, she works for a Web3 company. Mm -hmm. I'm, I would imagine doing GRC for Web3, which is like, you know, we still don't really know what Web3 is, what it looks like. We still yeah. don't know how security is going to be like distributed mm -hmm. because it's a distributed system. So that means security should, in theory, also be distributed as well. Yeah. So I think it just depends on where you are from a from a from a career, from like an actual knowledge standpoint, and then also like. Where, where your company is from a mm -hmm. technology standpoint. Right. So for me, I don't find GRC boring because Datadog, we're always building something new. We're oh, like, yeah. it's like the, the work never stops because yeah. we, we produce something new. It seems like every six weeks, there's a new, there's a new <laughs> product. <Yeah. laughs> so there's no time for you to be bored because you're, there's always different challenges. There's always different nuances to consider and there's different strategies to start implementing. So it can be, not for yeah. me though. Yeah. Sorry to use other people though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I like that. I like that you talked about like, you know, challenges and strategy. So like if you're someone who is, you know, who likes to solve problems, who likes, you know, you know, challenges, who is good at strategizing things, you know, figuring out a plan towards, you know, making something happen or finding a solution, then this might be something that you might find interesting. And in regards to, you know, some other things you said, it does and again especially being at that staff level it seems as though like you you a lot of what you do might require working together and you know bringing multiple people or multiple security teams in order to enable compliance for the organization what does that look like yeah so from a tactical standpoint it looks like me having a bunch of meetings all day right <laughs> right <laughs> which i don't like meeting but <laughs> Okay. In this type of, I don't, I'm not even going to do that like meetings. But in this type of environment where you are not responsible for any of the actual work, but you can kind of like influence and guide the direction yeah. that the work goes, I think it's important to build that relationship, right? Because one of the things that I think a lot of people misconstrue about GRC is that like a lot of people are not technical. Mm. And I think being technical has like different nuances right there are people who are hands on keyboard and there are people who who used to be hands on keyboard and can think about how we go from tactical to strategy mm -hmm. and then there are people who kind of like sit a little bit in between where they aren't hands on keyboard but they've interacted with enough technology to understand from the end user standpoint what it needs to look like or how the information will flow through the system to be able to give you some to treat some strategy yeah. on you know on that particular thing so for me the way that i view it is sorry i lost my train of thought because somebody called me no worries <laughs> anyway so the way that i view it is you really have to one understand where you fit in that spectrum and mm -hmm. then 
how you enable compliance will kind of naturally flow. So I'm an, I'm a curious person. I always want to like dig into the technology. I may not be building anything, yeah. but I'm going to understand how it's built. So one of the things that really benefited me at Datadog is that once I got access to our AWS account, I would just go into our, our console and I would just randomly start searching S3 buckets, mm. right? I'm like, I'm like, oh, let me see what this configuration <laughs> is. Oh, what's this? Yeah. I yeah. go into our Git and I just stumble upon like our code source and I'd be like, oh, how did I actually end up in the repo where our vault is, you know, it doesn't mm. matter. But I just started looking at it. And yeah. I'm, I'm just looking at like, you know, how often we're doing things like commits, how often are we doing scanning? I'm that person, like I'm a tinkerer. So yeah. I always made sure that I knew just enough about what was happening so that once it came time for me to actually propose a solution, I can go from tinkering into, okay, well, I know that this is built like this. And then we have these people using it and they're accessing, accessing it this way. Now let's come up with a strategy of how that's going to make everybody's lives easier. Mm. So it really just depends on your personality type and how you work. So yeah. it can look however you want it to look. <laughs> yeah. Now I love how you bring your perspective into that. Like you're, you know, on one end, you're like really trying to understand the technology and that, you know, gives you, you have that level of intimacy with how this thing works, you know, how the security, the security implications of like certain configurations of different things and that thing works. And you're able to sort of, take that knowledge and translate it into how do we build strategy around how to properly secure the uh, this technology or have, you know, policies or uh, compliance guardrails to ensure that, you know, things are probably done within the environment. And I think that completely, in my from my perspective, because I, I've never really known where to stand in regards to, you know, what exactly is the purpose and how interesting is GRC? But now your perspective is giving me like an understanding, like, okay, it's not just like someone who's just like sitting down and just like looking at, you know, documentation and writing different policies, but you do have to have some level of understanding of how things work. And that might involve you playing around with those things, you know, trying out different technologies and then using that knowledge and applying it as feedback into how you're going to actually, you know, strategize for building policies or even working with teams to enable compliance for their product or, you know, their, you know, code base, whatever the case is. And I really like that perspective on that. So you've cleared out a lot of misconceptions that I had, and I'm sure that people had on, on compliance. What other misconceptions are out there that you think need to be clarified about compliance, risk, and governance? Well, some people also think that you're going to make like a, a whole bunch of money doing this. <laughs> um, <laughs> First of all, the whole getting into cybersecurity thing is in itself can be a misconception, right? Because there's a mm. lot of people who are using security as like an influential mm. type of avenue, which is cool because I definitely want more people in cyber, right? Like we have like a global shortage, I think, or, you know, 3.6 million people or something like that. But I think that people need to be realistic. Like you're yeah. not going to learn how to write a policy in six months. You know, if you do a boot camp or if you just you, know, you look at a few YouTube or Udemy videos and all of a sudden you think that you're going to like come out the gate making six <laughs> figures. Yeah. That's so unrealistic. Now, what you can do is you can build up some technology, some technical skills, have like at least a deep understanding of how the technology works and then apply that to like everyday real world scenarios so that you can have an understanding and then it'll kind of get you further along. So I've had a lot of people message me on social media i want to get into i want to get into cybersecurity, and i always respond like okay cool why mm. and they're like that bag and i'm like <laughs> what bag <laughs> like people will gladly people will gladly give you a job offer for forty five thousand dollars in this yeah year. like let's, right. let's not let's not get crazy here <laughs> like, so i really want to clear that up like yes you can make a lot of money in this field in this field and mm -hmm. you can have a very lucrative career but not everybody does and not everybody stays in cybersecurity or infosec mm -hmm. whatever we're calling it yeah it's a hard field mm -hmm. especially with grc because like we're you don't really unless you are able to build relationships you can't really do any of the work you have to influence it so you have mm. to make people come to the water and you have to make the horse drink yeah <laughs> you yeah. know what i'm saying yeah that's really what infosec is having an understanding of how people work and what problems they're trying to solve and then being able to apply a security lens to that and partner with them on whatever solution it is that they're looking to implement is going to 
be a hundred times more successful than you trying to dictate to people. Because a lot of people look at security as like a dictatorship and not a partnership. Mm-hmm. So that's another misconception. It's yeah. I don't think it's I don't think it's exclusively one thing or another. It, at times we do need to say this is what it is, and mm-hmm. you shouldn't be doing anything different. Yeah. Um, but then at other times it's like okay, well this is what the requirements uh, is, rec- is is saying needs to happen, but that's not really like cut and dry in terms of how do we implement it within the way we build. So let's right. come up with a solution that works for where we're still satisfying the requirement, but it's not like taking away from what you have to do as a developer or as like an engineer. So lots of misconceptions. I think I just cleared up in that statement. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for clearing all that. I, I think like you can just easily like, if anyone comes and asks you like, oh, how do I get to cybersecurity? And like, they have a bunch of misconceptions. You can just send them like this clip and be like, hey, go watch that. <laughs> and it's like everything that you wanted to say is broken down in there. But we can sort of dig deeper into that. So again, you know, you've like you said, like there's a lot of bad advice and good advice out there on, you know, just how to get into cybersecurity, how to get into GRC, like, oh, just go go to this boot camp or just go take this certification, like telling like beginners to go take like a really advanced certification. Yeah. And it's just like really bad. And a lot of people are, you know, becoming influencers off it. Of course, nothing wrong with that, you know, but if you're doing it the right way, of course, there's no problem with that. I want to know, in your opinion, right, in 2023, right, because obviously you've been in this role, in this field for over a decade now, so you have a lot of experience in it. If someone wants to get into this field, right, specifically governance, risk, and compliance in 2023, and you were to give, sit them down and give them real advice on how to do it, what would be the best approach that you can say, okay, do this, do this in this sequence of steps? And this should, or hopefully, will help you get into a role of governance, risk, and compliance. Yeah. So I don't think anything needs to be done in a sequence because that kind of like pigeonholes people, right? But the things that I tell people to do all the time is just because you want to do GRC doesn't mean you're going to be good at it. That's one, Mm -hmm. right? Like it takes a very, I I think anybody has the mental capacity to, let me just clarify that. But you as a person, it may not be a good, personality fit or a fit for how you like to work so you need to first understand what do you want your day-to-day to to look like are you a meetings person are you a head down writing documentation person because in your first five years you might not be on no strategy track Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know yeah you might just be writing documents you might just be sitting in audits if that's not you then you probably should consider something else you also want to consider the industry that you want to work in because that can make a break uh, how you view GRC work. As I mm-hmm. mentioned before, if you're working for a company that's on prem, they don't want to do any, they don't want to use any advanced technology. And you're like a person like me who likes to tinker, who likes to learn about new things, that may not work either. So yeah. determine like determine like who you are, determine the industry that you want to be in, and then I, I always say, what is your why? What is the mm-hmm. reason why you want to do this? Are you the type of person that actually like sees the world as an opportunity to like improve our technical experience in this world? Are you the type of person that has like morals and values and like this is, you know, things should be done a certain way? Then yeah, I think that that would be a great fit for how you view the world. So that's just like the who you are part. Now, in terms of like the actual work that you need to do, the rest of this is going to be boring. It's not going to be sexy work, right? Because you need to sit down and and actually figure out what is NIST 853. What exactly is the goal of that publication? What is SOC 2? What what is PCI? What is ISO? Because now you need to start translating the who you are part into like learning about what these frameworks are what's the purpose and what what is it that we're trying to achieve by having these frameworks Mm. and then once you actually start digging into it you may still hate it and just say you know what forget it i don't want to do this (laughs) you have to learn (laughs) you have to learn how to interpret controls you have to know when it says you know this mechanism or this system will have a mechanism to to determine vulnerabilities you have to Mm -hmm. know that that means that okay we need to have some sort of vulnerability scanner or we need to have a process that will identify any vulnerabilities within our code base Mm -hmm. you need to be able to translate what i consider lawyer speak in a sense into like real world application and then use that to help somebody else build something right so there's a lot of like shifting of the mind that needs to happen And then on top of it, now you need to also build up on some of your technical knowledge. 
You need to understand the fundamentals of networking. You need to understand how a simple computer works. You, I can't, like, you wouldn't believe how many people I've had conversations with. And I'm like, <laughs> talking to them about like, okay, we'll learn networking. I'm like, well, why do I need to know that? How do you know what you're securing if you don't yeah. know what the <laughs> what the OSI model is? Like, and mm -hmm. this is old school stuff, but like, it's still applicable even in the cloud environment. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, you need to understand uh, what <laughs> what TLS is and why it's important and what mm -hmm. happens when the data is actually secured in transit like you need to understand what that means right because now you now that's a, a conversation of okay we need to implement like load balancing now we need to have like a high proxy or now we need to make sure that our nodes are operating properly like these are all things that you need to understand that is applicable to the to the actual technology that you can then translate back into like okay this is what they're doing now let me write this up so that an auditor will understand it yeah so i i say you need a lot of learning you gotta hustle yeah you gotta no, hustle. i love that yeah <laughs> yeah no absolutely absolutely and i wanted to like touch on a couple of things you said like one of the most important things you talked about is your why and i think that's like something that a lot of people just kind of like it just flies over their head they're like cybersecurity, six figures i'm into it right like they don't think about oh why do i want to get into it? it's like oh I can make this amount of money right here. I can do this like, you know, sexy hacking hacking thing, right? I can do all this and all of that stuff. And they just like, all the other possible reasons why they could get cybersecurity just like flies over their head. Of course, like money is is a good motivation. It's like, it's totally fine. Like everybody wants to be able to provide for their families, want to be able to, you know, have money. We need money to survive, obviously, right? But there should be probably maybe a, you know, secondary driving factor for why you want to get into this because, if the money's not there or if it gets to a point where the money's no longer a driving factor, you really have nothing else to keep you driven and your job just becomes something that you just like go to every day and, you know, you're just trying to, you're just looking for, you're not looking forward to the next day. So having that, you know, why is really, really important. I think a lot of people need to reconsider that before just like being like, oh, cybersecurity, money and just get into it. So I love that you broke that down. Another thing that you talked about was, hey, real quick, you know what's crazy? Over 60% of you watching right now are not subscribed. So do me a quick favor, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification so you also get notified whenever we drop any new video and you don't miss anything. So yeah, back to the video, back to the video. Thank you, back to the video. Frameworks. So I know a huge part of like compliance is like, you know, dealing with a lot of frameworks. So all like learning these frameworks, like there's a, there's a ton of them. There's like NIST, there's PCI, you know, GD, I, I don't know if GDPR is a framework, SOC, all of those things. How important, you know, are these things for getting into compliance and also like when you're working in, in a compliance role? Well, it's a hundred percent important. Like mm -hmm. there's no way you can be in GRC or in compliance and not have an understanding of any, of any framework. Uh, not all of them. You don't need to know all of them, but I would say at least the foundational ones in my personal opinion are SOC 2 and ISO because those are international. Those are what I like to call non-prescriptive and what people in the industry call non-prescriptive prescriptive basically mm -hmm. they're not telling you how you need to do it they're just saying you need to get it done so those mm -hmm. are the opportunities those are the frameworks that gives you the most opportunities to learn but then also i think they're written a little bit clearer than some of the other ones yeah but you can't be a grc professional and not know anything about a framework that's just yeah. not going to work yeah. <laughs> like that's, yeah. that's literally our bread and butter yeah Gotcha, gotcha. Thanks for clarifying that. And another thing you talk about is like the basics. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people want to skip over. They want to just like go from like zero to pen tester, right? Yeah. Or zero to compliance analyst or whatever. And or zero to suck analyst, right? And mm. like it's like there, there's a lot that happens in the middle of that that involves you really, really understanding like, you know, the basics, the fundamentals, because that's what's going to be the foundation for the rest of your career. And then the fourth thing I wanted to get into was legalities, right? You said something along the lines of like, you know, basically uh, translating legal speak into something else. In the field of governance, risk, and compliance, how much, you know, do you have to deal with, you know, legal stuff? Because I know like in stuff like forensics, they probably have to deal with like, you know, lawyers or like uh, law for enforcement for some of their ca cases. I know like compliance also has some elements of that as well. How much of that uh, does it involve? Yeah. So I think it depends on the organization that you're in, because a lot of times companies will combine GRC and privacy work together. And mm. you, you talked about GDPR. So GDPR is a law in okay. 
in, in the EU. So it's basically yeah. saying that you have to maintain privacy. Mm -hmm. like, otherwise, you're going to get fined because you broke the law. So there are there are overlaps. And sometimes some organizations treat them as the same, but they're not the same. Mm -hmm. They're complementary, but they're different. So it it would be it would be nice for you to understand why cybersecurity is a thing now because of all of the back the, the backstory of, of it was like it kind of started from the computer law that the US had. Like I think they wrote this in like 1991 or something like that. Yeah. I might be I might be misquoting it. So please don't please don't come for me. And and basically when when computers started becoming a thing so did you know bad actors right because it gave people more access so then having a law that basically stated like how you would use a computer is literally why we are here yeah. <laughs> this is why yeah. this is a career field right so you do have to understand like a little bit about like why cybersecurity became the thing that it is today and then understand how laws interact with the cyberspace so from the human aspect and years ago, I did a talk about like cyberbullying and cyber harassment. So mm -hmm. these are things that are offshoot of how to interact over the internet today and being able to use geolocation to like stalk somebody. Mm -hmm. So if you understand how the laws are implemented and how the laws are so far behind and how to protect people, how to protect organizations and how to protect who you are in the digital space, it kind of makes a little bit more sense as to why some of these frameworks exist. Yeah. So it's basically breaking down all the different ways that you can potentially break a law or like somebody mm. can, you know, use a, a, a computer to basically like ruin your life or you know take down your business. Yeah. So you don't have to be a lawyer. I'm not saying mm. that. I'm just saying it would be nice for you to at least have like a, a foundational understanding of like what laws are applicable to cybersecurity. Gotcha. Yeah. No, thanks for clarifying that. I like I've never had to do anything like in regards to like having to deal with like any sort of like law enforcement or like law or like uh, legal stuff. But I do know like there's some aspect of cybersecurity that, you know, some of it plays a bit of a role in those things. And it's always good to kind of, you know, know those things, whether, you know, you're trying to get into that field or just like for general knowledge. But another thing is, you know, outside of all the governance risk and compliance and cybersecurity and all of that stuff, you happen to be a digital nomad and you've been doing this for yeah. quite a while. Uh, so I want to get into that because something that's really cool about you. So why did you get into it? And when did you get into it? And, you know, what's fun about it? What makes you what made you want to get into doing that? Yeah. So years ago, I always wanted to travel the globe. That's always mm -hmm. been like a dream of mine. And I never really felt like I could do it. Oddly enough, before I started working at Datadog and right before the pandemic happened, I was interviewing for this company. They said that I could work anywhere in the world. I was like, bet. So <laughs> literally, I was <laughs> I was in the interview process, getting towards the end. I was already looking up how to like get a visa in South Africa. Right. I was about to just take my take my talent to, to South Africa and just live my best life. Yeah. And and it didn't pan out with that company, but mm. I think just seeing that this was possible was like it. And then I ended up working at Datadog shortly after, and I was 100% remote. And then the pandemic hit. And I was just like, and I really had a, it's pretty morbid, but I had a moment where I was just like, this is a, this is a global pandemic. Everything is shut down. People are dying left and right. And like mm -hmm. all my sisters are nurses. So I would hear horror stories from the ER because like they would have people coding out every single day. Dang. And I was just like, I could die tomorrow. And I did not see the world. Mm. That's all I needed. That's yeah. it. Like it was just that moment. And so Every opportunity I get, I will go to a different country and like eat. And it doesn't have to be for long, but I'll explore a different country. I always make sure that I do this, you know, touristy things, but I also do like culturally relevant things in every place mm. that I've been to yeah. because I connect with people by learning about their culture and yeah. like understanding the similarities and the differences that we have. So it's been, it's been really interesting and really cool just being able to explore other cultures and other places. Yeah, no, I love that. And, you know, even from your 
from the way you've talked about governance, risk and, risk and compliance, you sound like someone who loves solving challenges. So I imagine that there have been some challenges that you might have faced, you know, during this experience. How do you navigate these challenges, especially being in like an entirely different country with different cultural values, different languages, different ways of living? How do you have you solve the challenges of just like integrating yourself into these environments? Yeah, so I always plan out where I'm going first and foremost. I always take a look at like what's happening in that country because mm -hmm. I don't want to be uninformed. Yeah. So just kind of seeing, I always try to go places that have like really, really high safety ratings for like women because there are reports out there that kind of show which countries are not the best for like safe or for LGBT or that has like, you know, issues with racism or xenophobia. Yeah. And so I always do a lot of planning that way, first and foremost. So that kind of helps. Uh, but then I always try to learn at least some basics of like the language. Yeah. I need to learn, you know, how to order some food, how to say hello, how to ask for help, how to ask for the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so just what I find is that if you at least attempt, then people like are more open to you. Mm. So one of the th one of the things that I also saw firsthand is like how entitled Americans can be where like we will go to somebody else's country and don't even try to speak their language. Like we expect mm. them to speak English. And I'm like, girl, yeah. poor guy, <laughs> you're in somebody else's country. Like, right. that's crazy. Right. <laughs> Take a step back yeah. and like really evaluate what you're doing. So mm -hmm. I think just coming into it with like an open mind, but also like planning and like just having a, you know, a loose plan helps. And also doing this has like forced me to be a lot more patient. Mm. Like you can't, the, some countries do not have the same concept of time. Mm. Some places time is very fluid. Yeah. <laughs> Where six <laughs> o'clock really means 6.30, 6.45 or whenever yeah. you get there. Yeah. So, you know, having, coming from a place where like, if you set an appointment in six o'clock and you're mm -hmm. not eating six ten, you're not there. Your, your appointment is canceled. And you don't get your yeah. money back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's different than you show up on time and you're waiting for people, or you show up and like you know maybe the store is not open, or the restaurant's not open, or they're not even open for that whole entire day, even though their business hours say you know they're supposed to be open today. So there, there's a lot of nuances, and and I, what I'm realizing is like the concept of C, uh, CPC is really a thing mm -hmm. <laughs> globally <laughs> yeah 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 it does it does sound like you have like experience of you know various things you know over traveling around being in different cultures even like just things that have helped you grow as a person you know personality wise and just in general like understanding like trying to assimilate into different cultures you know being patient and stuff like that of all the things you've learned right in your experience you know being a digital nomad what has been the biggest takeaway for, for you? I cannot control everything around me. Mm. And honestly, as a person who is, or I guess was a type A personality that has to have order, that has to have a plan, that was very challenging. Like I had yeah. to rethink the way I present into this world and like the way I see the world. Because like out of all the things that happened in my life, I, I control a, a lot of it, but I can't control all of it, especially yeah. when... I have to deal with other people or I have to deal with like a system. Mm -hmm. And so having the ability to take a step back and say, okay, I can't control this. How do I want to navigate this? Do I choose to be angry and, you know, unable to move forward? Or do I look at the situation and say, okay, let me pivot, let me yeah. pivot and let me figure out, you know, a different path. And there have been times where I've had to pivot, you know, pivot in the moment. I'm at yeah. the airport and I missed my flight because of something stupid. And now I'm like, okay, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to yeah. stay here and be upset about it? Or am I going to like find a solution? Yeah. I always have to find a solution. I always have to pivot because mm -hmm. breaking down in that moment and like, you know, giving into like anger or whatever my emotion is, it's never helpful. But yeah. what is helpful is going on Google and like, you know, Google flights and like, okay, what, where can I get to? Or yeah. what are my options here? You know, that I think has made me not only it's like a better person, but I think it's changed my outlook on life and the control issues that I may have. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Like just being able to, you know, sort of like maneuver your way around like these difficult and complex situations because 
I am very sure like it's because okay, I I I I was born and raised in Nigeria and you know coming here was like a very entirely different experience. But I can imagine that if you were to travel to Nigeria, spending most of your life in the United States and something were to sort of happen in Nigeria that you don't have any knowledge about how to do anything about, like you'd have to be, you know, really, really good on being patient and maneuvering around that situation in order to figure out figure out a solution, you know, and find your way forward. So I think those those are really, really, you know, great lessons that I'm sure have also probably added some benefit to your professional life as well. Uh, so thank you for sharing all of those things. And now that we're rounding up, I wanted to see if you had any, you know, pieces of advice for anyone out there, you know, who is interested in cybersecurity. You've already shared like in a lot of, you know, things, you know, about like what you should know, you know, how to navigate things, you know, tuning out all the noise out there. But is there like any last words of wisdom you wanted to share with them? Yeah, I've already mentioned like you have to be a hustler, but like I wanted to clarify what I mean by that. So mm -hmm. this, there's a lot of opportunities out here to get into cybersecurity. It's very vast, it's broad. But that doesn't mean that you have to stick with one thing. A lot of mm. people, they get into one field and they realize this isn't for me. As long as you learn how to build transferable skills and having that foundational knowledge that we talked about is going to be key to where you can always like, you know, dip back into your bag and be like, okay, I don't know how to be a stock analyst, but I at least know like, you know, the fundamentals of like networking and I can understand all of these aspects that could help me land this mm -hmm. job. You have to build your network. You have to, and it's not just following people that like talk pretty about cybersecurity. It's also the people that don't say anything about cybersecurity too. Mm -hmm. Cause like on my LinkedIn, I really don't talk about cybersecurity yeah. because it's not, it's not who I am. It's what I do. Yeah. And so you have to kind of like fill your network up with people who are knowledgeable, knowledgeable, who are experienced, but then also, who may be well connected, but build a relationship. Don't just follow me on LinkedIn and immediately ask me to be your mentor because the answer is always going to be no. I don't know you. <laughs> but then also, like right. you, you have to, you also have to like, you have to be strategic about how you're approaching people and how you're looking to get mentored. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what it is you want to do, if you don't know, you know your why. If you don't have an understanding of like, at least, okay, what certs do I need? What baseline, base level skills do I need? What exactly are you looking for someone to help mentor you on? Like, do you want them to give you a blueprint? Yeah, That's the quickest way to get blocked. Like people are not about to just spoon feed you how right. to do this. Yeah. You have to do the work yourself. Yeah, But in you doing the work, understanding what work it is you're looking to do is mm -hmm. critical getting your network together, learning how to communicate with those people, and then creating a plan. I think a lot of people think that just getting a CISSP, which is very unrealistic, I'll say that if you don't have five years of experience, you will not get a CISSP. You can pass the exam all you want, yeah. but they're not going to issue you a cert. Yeah, facts. I mean, in the exam, you probably won't even be able to sit for it unless you can demonstrate some level of experience doing something. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not an easy cert. It's it's yeah. not a it's not an entry level cert. I'm I'm going on a tangent. Please don't <laughs> yeah, good. CISSP. Like I don't yeah. even have the CISSP, and I've been doing this for twelve years. So mm -hmm. like it's not an easy cert to get. Like let's stop yeah. it. Yeah. And if you have it and no work experience, I'm questioning how you achieved it. <laughs> right. 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 Facts. Anyway. Facts. <laughs> um, back to what I was saying. Uh, you know, you got to learn, you have to build up some skills, create your plan, whether it's like six months, nine months. And some people, it takes longer than nine months. It takes, it takes over a year for you to like actually develop some things yeah. and develop some skills. If you want to do something more technical, more hands-on, get you a lab, actually build a lab, start doing some like smaller pen tests, start with like seeing if you can get into your router at home. There's little things that you can do to like build up your skills, right? Yeah. I, I think people just automatically assume that oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get into cybersecurity, that I'm gonna be a hacker, and I'm gonna go try to hack the the Pentagon. And it's like, okay, <laughs> please relax. <laughs> like you don't even know what an ACL is yet, but right. you over here talking about like. Con <laughs> I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. Like the fundamentals are important, right? Like, and it you build upon each block, mm -hmm. like. That's why you need to create your plan. And the plan needs to be realistic. Yeah, I've had conversations with people that they're like, well, this is my learning plan. 
And they literally have things like for GRC, for SOC, for pen testing. They have vulnerability scanners. And then they have network engineering. And I said, mm. this is like seven jobs. Yeah. You're not going to be able to learn seven jobs in nine months. Like that's yeah. Or any please, job. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just like, okay, like, so what is it do you actually want to do? And then they tell mm -hmm. me, and I'm just like, okay, well, literally 75% of this can come off. Yeah. And then Google, Google, YouTube, yes. Udemy yes. free sites, you know, or like the flash sales that you, Udemy has, like, mm -hmm. you don't have to spend a lot yeah. to become knowledgeable. Yeah. But what you do have to do if you're not going to spend on like a structured boot camp is you have to be disciplined. Yes. And if you're yeah. not disciplined, I don't think this is the right field for you anyway. <laughs> facts, facts, facts. But that goes back to knowing who you are. If yeah. you are not a disciplined person, do not get into cybersecurity. I, I I would almost dare say tech, but that's that's very broad. That could be mm -hmm. anything. But yeah. I can only speak to cybersecurity. So, I mean, I feel like I just preached a whole sermon. But Yeah, no, preach. <laughs> 100%, 100%. Those are all facts, yeah. all facts, all facts. Thanks for all the all that advice. So, you know, in the future, what does what does the future of Easy look like? You know, after after this podcast and here on uh, onwards. Well, I'm going back to the things that I've been doing, which is staying low key. <laughs> <laughs> I I probably will pop up once or twice more, like a speaking engagement here and there. But mm -hmm. honestly, I'm moving into like the latter parts of my years where mm -hmm. I'm no longer focusing on like climbing the corporate ladder. Like, yeah, it's, it's great to like want to get promoted, but I don't, I don't feel like I need to prove myself anymore because I've been there, done that. And yeah. it's mostly just, just enjoying the fruits of my labor, enjoying, you know, the career that I've built. And then just eventually go into like not working because mm. my dream job is really to be Paris Hilton, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. want to work. I just want to wake up and be rich and do whatever <laughs> I want. <laughs> yeah. Don't we all. Um, <laughs> Right? Well, some yeah. people actually enjoy working. I don't know who true. those people are personally, but. <laughs> no, true. <laughs> but uh, super excited for what the future holds for you. Now that we're rounding up, um, thanks for all the knowledge you've all the knowledge you've shared, your experience, all of that, and I'm um, you know super excited for when people actually watch this because like they're going to get a lot of value and insight, you know, from everything you've shared. So where can people find you if they want to connect with you? Um, hopefully, not asking you to just directly be their mentor. Yeah. So. I you can honestly the best best way is LinkedIn because mm -hmm. I used to be more active on Twitter and now I don't really tweet anymore. I have it. You can follow me, but you're not going to learn much of anything. I mean, you're not going to learn <laughs> anything from me in any of my social media. Sure. But if you do want to connect, uh, you can do uh, LinkedIn. It's my full name, which I'm not even going to say. You're probably just going to post it on. <laughs> I'll put the links in the, the description. Yeah. Yes, because my name is long. And then uh, my Twitter is is underscore Vix. If you do care to follow me on there, but you're not going to get much value from that, honestly. I'm just, just going to be honest. But every once in a while, I'll I will tweet something relevant. Mm -hmm. But I'm yeah. mostly just watching and liking stuff that I find funny now. That's totally good. <laughs> That's totally good. Uh, but thank you so much once again. You know, thanks for hopping on, sharing all of your experience, and I look forward to when we drop this episode. Yeah, I can't wait to see myself on your <laughs> <laughs> on your podcast. Yeah, that'll be great. <laughs> it'll be it'll be good. It'll be good. Well, uh, thanks for coming on again, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Hey, what is up, guys? Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to click here for future and previous episodes of the podcast, and also don't forget to subscribe. And uh, I will see you in the next episode. Thank you.